A loud bang shatters the silence. Followed by a barrage of cops rushing in, guns drawn. These kind of stings aren't uncommon. Ask Alicia Ponsivan about her time in Cornelia, Georgia. I'm trying to push the officer off my husband. He's saying he can't breathe. You know, it's just another officer staying over him with his foot ready to smash his face. It just, for what reason? She heard her children crying. Deputies wouldn't let her see her youngest, an 18-month-old boy nicknamed Boo Boo, but she saw his crib. There was a giant hole in his playpen. We heard him crying. He said, your son's fine. He had just lost a tooth. You guys can, you know, they took him for observation. But when Alicia and her husband arrived at the hospital, their son was in a coma in the ICU. They had him on a part of the unit at the hospital where people were just dying left and right. We didn't know. When the SWAT team burst through the doors of this quiet North Georgia home, they threw a flash grenade to stun the occupants. It landed in their 18-month-old's face. And he had not just lost a tooth. His whole nose, his face was blown open. You could see his whole rib cage. It was hard. It was devastating. All over what deputies later admitted in court documents and interviews was a low-level drug investigation that netted no drugs, no weapons, and no arrests. This family was torn apart, both figuratively and literally, because of bad intel and what a grand jury called sloppy planning and a zeal to use force in a drug investigation. I wish the Ponspons nightmare was a rarity, but it's becoming less so because police are deploying heavily armed tactical units into our communities like never before. And it's not just in big cities, it's in small ones too. And when SWAT isn't done right, it can go really, really wrong. Tearing down of a door, police storming your house in the middle of the night, um, it's, it's terrifying. Uh, there's a very low margin for error by you or the police. If anybody gets it wrong, so, you know, there's a very high probability that someone's going to die. It might be someone involved in drugs, but it might be an innocent family member or an officer. Bradley Balco, I'm a um, uh, opinion journalist at the Washington Post, and I wrote the book uh, Rise of the Warrior Cop. Balco spent decades documenting how America's police have turned to military-style weapons and tactics, even for everyday investigations. And he says because SWAT teams are the cool tool in police circles, everybody wants one, even small towns that may not have the money or staffing to do it properly. The Department of Justice says nearly a third of police agencies serving under 100,000 residents employ a SWAT team, which is great when you've got a hostage or armed fugitive situation. But those are incredibly rare. So agencies start using SWAT for everyday policing, blowing down doors that could have easily just been knocked upon. Recent estimates indicate the number of SWAT raids across America has soared from 3,000 a year in the 1980s to 60,000 a year now, more than 160 a day. And only an estimated 7% of those are for hostage, barricade, or active shooter situations. 62% are for drug searches. More than a third of those turn up no illegal drugs or guns whatsoever. It's the vast majority of, that, uh, of the use of that kind of violence, it's overwhelmingly used to serve warrants on people who are still merely suspected uh, of nonviolent uh, drug crimes, consensual crimes. Like the raid in the small Connecticut hamlet of Easton, where police admitted to the accidental killing of an unarmed 33-year-old or the drug sting in Framingham, Mass, where police had to pay a family millions after accidentally killing a 68-year-old grandfather of 12, or the no-knock raid that killed Breonna Taylor in Louisville. As you may have guessed by now, these raids overwhelmingly target Blacks and Hispanics. Critics say when you've got a SWAT team, everything starts looking like an occasion to break it out. Just listen to the sheriff of Lake County, Florida, talking about how the opioid epidemic has given his agency new opportunities to use its SWAT team. So, to the dealers I say, enjoy looking over your shoulder, constantly wondering if today's the day. We come for you. Enjoy trying to sleep tonight, wondering if tonight's the night our SWAT team blows your front door off the hinges. Wow! Can I just point out, 
This is the sheriff's community engagement unit. When cops' attitude on community engagement includes blowing off doors and rushing civilians with assault rifles, maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that tragedies are unfolding in communities across the country. Like the accidental killing of an Iraqi vet shot at least 60 times during a botched drug raid in Arizona. Or when Virginia SWAT accidentally killed an unarmed optometrist suspected of the super dangerous crime of betting on football. Or the death of a small town Texas deputy shot when the suspected marijuana dealer they raided in the middle of the night was startled and fired at what he thought were home invaders. It happens more often than you may realize. When you tear up someone's door down in the middle of the night while they're sleeping, uh, you elicit a very primitive response in them, a very a fight, or, fight or flight response. So there's a, a high probability they can assume that you're, you're there to do them harm. Even critics acknowledge there are occasions that call for SWAT, but to do one of the hardest jobs in law enforcement right SWAT requires money and a lot of training and exceptional standards. Throughout most of the US, there are no SWAT training requirements whatsoever and no reporting requirements either. The Department of Justice told me they don't even know how many small communities across the US have their own SWAT teams, but Balco says they keep popping up in tiny towns like Eustis, Florida, Keene, New Hampshire, and Nina, Wisconsin where Chief Aaron Olson told me it's been nothing but positive for them. We don't use the SWAT team very often in Nina at all, but the officers who have that extra training who are always working on our shift, if something comes up that's somewhat critical, that doesn't need SWAT, their expertise and training helps diffuse situations. While there are no national requirements for SWAT teams, there are guidelines set up by the National Tactical Officers Association a minimum of 15 officers per SWAT team, with each member training for at least 200 hours a year. Nina's chief acknowledges he doesn't meet those minimums. He says they're just not realistic for small departments with limited staffs and limited budgets. If you just send an officer into a drug dealer's house to get their drugs, take them to jail, bad things are gonna happen. So our SWAT teams around America are trained, and trained well on how to do these search warrants without having to use deadly force. Yet, in the communities that tend to have the absolute fewest violent incidents, college campuses, SWAT teams have multiplied as well. In 2004, the Department of Justice estimated there were 50 university police departments with their own special tactical teams. That number was north of 160 just seven years later. Even though colleges are almost always located inside municipalities with better police resources. Even some of SWAT's advocates Chris Naco, Sheriff, Pasco County, Florida. Wonder why small agencies have them. We're a large organization. Our budget's roughly around $150 million. Our population's close to 600,000 people. I don't know what goes on in those small organizations. I don't know how much they're able to train, but I can tell you from us being a larger organization, it is a heavy load, but it is an important load that we have to do. Sheriff Naco says without proper training, tactical operations can make a community less safe. But he advocates a series of solutions, including regionalization, so the financial and manpower commitments are spread across multiple agencies. Also, prioritizing active shooter training over SWAT, because by the time your artillery arrives, the shooting's usually done. It's better to put the resources on the front line because those frontline law enforcement officers are gonna be the ones that are responding to the active shooter. And we saw that in Columbine, and we learned from it from Columbine that 10 seconds can make the difference between life and death for many people. Smarter policing and better training is what this family has been asking for for six years since a flash grenade exploded in their baby's face. It, it would be another three weeks before we got to touch and hold him again. I'm so grateful, no, oh, my baby, my little boy, the only one I got. Now seven and living in Wisconsin, Boo Boo's a survivor of both a grenade and 27 reconstructive surgeries. He's not done with them either, but he is making a lot of progress. When he smiles, you can see his teeth now. Before it was all scar tissue, it blew, it blew open from all the way at the top of his nose down to his whole face. Who was my hero? 
He's strong. He's intelligent. He's kind. And he's he's always got everybody's back. It's the same kind of trust she wants to have again one day in local police. But like Boo Boo's Road to Recovery, it's a long one.